You're listening to the Weekly Wrap-Up on Sprott Money News. Well, hello once again from Sprott Money News and SprottMoney.com. It's Friday, August 16th, 2019. This is your Weekly Wrap-Up. I'm your host, Craig Hemke. Going it alone for a few minutes here this Friday because Eric Sprott is currently north of the Arctic Circle fishing for char, which is what retirees do. I'll be joined in a few moments by Rick Rule instead, and Rick has some very, very interesting commentary that I encourage you to listen to. Before we get there, though, just a quick wrap-up of the week's events. It has been a very busy week for the precious metals. As we record this on Friday morning, gold is actually up more than 1% on the week, though. doesn't feel like it after that crazy day we had back on Tuesday. I've got a last of about 1524 in the December COMEX contract. That's up $16 so far in the week. So we're looking at another good, solid weekly gain for gold. Silver up as well, looking to close above $17 today, if it can hang in there. It's currently around $17.15. Both of those are really nice levels and some of the highest levels we've seen in quite a while, particularly in gold. If gold can close up here north of $15.20, that will be the best weekly close for gold since before it broke down back in April of 2013. So that would be a really good level to watch all through the day today to see if we can close north of 1520. Really, anytime you can put on another green candle on that chart, it's a good sign. We've had quite a rally. No doubt there are some indications that, at least at the, on the COMEX level, things are getting a little overbought and a little heavy. And as you know, bull markets in the precious metals are typically defined by kind of a two steps forward, one step back pattern. We're quite obviously, at least to my eyes, in a renewed and solid bull market once we broke above 1360 a couple of months back. And things are just looking uh, looking very solid for the precious metals at this point. Helping us along is the global bond market. We now have over $16 trillion worth of negative yielding bonds around the planet. Most of that is sovereign debt, where the entire yield curve of Germany, the entire yield curve of Switzerland, the entire yield curve of the Netherlands is in negative yields. Negative yields. My goodness. Uh, But besides just that, there's now more than a trillion dollars worth of corporate debt that is also hosting a negative yield. It is a remarkable world that we live in here in 2019. Eric and I often talk about negative yields being one of the strongest fundamentals for physical gold ownership. You are ever going to find the argument from traditional asset managers is always that gold doesn't pay a dividend, right? And you actually have to pay to store it, make giving it a negative yield. Well, heck, if the bank or uh, government is going to charge you interest to store or hold your cash, well, that sure makes the argument for owning physical gold even stronger. So please remember to always visit Sprott Money. You can come to SprottMoney.com and find all sorts of great opportunities to, to acquire and hold physical precious metal. We'll also store it for if you'd like. You can also hold physical precious metal in your registered investments. You can diversify your RRSP portfolio or your IRA with physical gold and silver through Sprott Money. So again, SprottMoney.com. You can call us at 888-861-0775 at any time. And one more thing. If you ever do find yourself in a cash crunch in need of some liquidity, hey, Sprott Money will buy your metal from you as well. We actively buy investment-grade precious metals, and we'll buy back any precious metals that you purchase through us as well. So, hey, we are all-purpose. Give us a call, 888-861-0775 to learn more. I'm going to turn it over now to a conversation I had yesterday with Rick Rule of Sprott USA. Rick, gosh, there's hardly anybody in this industry more respected and uh, more wise and experienced than Rick Rule. I urge you to listen to this entire conversation as it is full of really insightful points from Rick. I asked him to kind of elaborate on some of the things that Eric and I talk about on a weekly basis. And Rick has 
has some thoughts of his own that you're going to want to hear. So please finish up this podcast by listening to the entire thing here with Rick Rule. And then, of course, come back next week when Eric will return and we'll see how things look then. So joining us now is Rick Rule. Most of you are familiar with Rick. He is, of course, a renowned natural resource investor. He's with Sprott USA and uh, is obviously well-respected in our industry and in our sector. And so it's uh, with Eric's absence today, it's great to get uh, Rick's perspective on things. Rick, thank you so much for your time. Always a pleasure and a delight and honor to fill in for Eric. Big shoes. <laughs> Very big shoes. Thank you for helping me. I wouldn't want to have to do, try to do this myself. Nobody would listen. So thankfully, uh, I've got your expertise to rely upon this week. Uh, my friend, I want to ask you, we're going to just hit three quick topics. Um, if anything, because these are topics that Eric has been mentioning frequently almost every week for the last month or two. And I thought, hey, you know what? Uh, you guys have known each other for a long time, but but you look at things, you know, you don't look at things identically. So I'd love to get your perspective. First and foremost, I mean, this has been a fun year, uh, especially since the end of May. We've had this tremendous run in gold. Silver just now starting to pick up. Eric's obviously really excited uh, about where he thinks prices are headed the remainder of this year and into the next. Uh, Rick, what do you think? How do you feel about uh, the metals in general at this point? I think you can't not be excited, particularly about the precious metals. We could talk about industrial materials later. But with regards to the precious metals, which are, of course, Eric's focus, uh, I don't think you can help but be uh, excited. Uh, Eric and I, for years, have agreed on the slogan, which is that bear markets are the authors of bull markets, and bull markets are the authors of bear markets. These are extremely cyclical businesses. And the bear market that we've just been through is really, truly one for the record books, the Toronto Stock Exchange Venture Resource Index was off by something like 85% in nominal terms, mm. more in real terms. So what you've seen so far, uh, rather than being a rally, has been just a bit of a bounce from oversold levels. I don't think that the equities prices that we've seen so far come anywhere close to matching the underlying move that we've seen in the metal and historically, the equity prices substantially outpace the metal. So, yes, I'm absolutely excited. By the way, that doesn't mean that we won't back and fill in this market. No market goes straight to heaven. Right. So there are going to be ups and downs. But I think you're going to see higher highs and higher lows. In other words, my, my own belief is that the bull market is now with us. It's an excellent point, Rick. I mean, you think the price of gold's up, what, 30% maybe? And yet the GDX as an ETF is up, what, 60? I mean, you'd think the leverage would be greater than that. The, the leverage is greater than, than that. Uh, I think one of the things that we're seeing is typical of the early stages of a bull market. The, the people move into the primary metal first, and that makes perfect sense. If you think that gold's going to go up, the first thing you do is buy gold. Right. Uh, you don't do the collateral trade. Now, the more sophisticated response is, of course, to buy the equities, where there is both greater risk and greater reward. So we are where we would expect to be uh, in a rally. I'm just surprised with the strength of the gold move that we haven't seen a better response so far from the equities. Yeah, I wonder, too, if there isn't a little bit of skepticism still. You know, that 2016 really kind of pulled the rug out from under so many people because they didn't believe it at first. And then it maybe didn't start buying the miners until the summertime. And then, it, you know, that was the final 10 percent of the move. Maybe there's still some, you know, a healthy degree of skepticism there. Well, certainly that's human nature. You know, yeah. uh, people can be intellectually interested in the narrative, uh, but uh, the fact is that it takes a price move to justify the narrative. And people's expectation of the future is set by their experience in the immediate past, which is why a, a 40 or 50 percent move is what it takes to begin to stimulate uh, <laughs> people's yeah. basis, baser instincts, their greed. Yeah. Uh, that's why bull markets go on longer than they should and where bear markets, why bear markets fall more deeply than they should. Yeah. A really interesting uh, point is, is very recently I was able to give a lecture at our own Sprott Vancouver Natural Resources Symposium with a 40-year uh, gold mining equities chart from Barron's, a superb chart. And one of the – there were a couple of interesting things about the chart, and I'm not a technical analyst, by the way, 
But it was so obvious where we were in terms of the market, uh, that is, at the bottom on a, on a 40-year cycle, and also so obvious uh, how much room there is in even a small gold uh, equities bull market. You know, if you look back over sort of seven or eight uh, recent recoveries in gold equities, a poor recovery is 150 or 200 percent. Hmm. A grand recovery is 1,200 percent. Now, I'm not suggesting that your listeners go out, take a second mortgage on their house, and buy penny gold stocks. Uh, what I am suggesting is that as an investing public, and I'm speaking in U.S. terms now, I know there's a lot of Canadians that listen to this, but in U.S. terms, the market share of precious metals and precious metals equities uh, as a percentage of total investable assets ownership is between one-third and one-half of one percent. Yeah. In 1981, at the top of the epic gold bull market, the same number was eight percent. And the three-decade mean is between 2 and 2.5%. Two and so if you assume, don't assume that gold and precious metals equities will reclaim their prior market, market share in terms of investable assets. Just think about a return to the three-decade mean. If you had a return to the three-decade mean, demand for precious metals and precious metals equities in the United States, which is 24% of the world's investable assets, would quadruple or quintuple. I want everybody to kind of mark that spot in this podcast. And when we're done, go back and listen to that again, please. Oh, that's some fantastic information, Rick. And I, that's something everybody needs to give a thorough consideration to. My second question for you is, is kind of gets to process, if you will. Uh, Eric alerted us all, myself included, a couple months back, that it's the large cap, uh, highly leveraged, if you will, producers that surge first in a bull market because, you know, if you're making $100 an ounce at $1,200 gold, you're making $200 an ounce at $1,300 gold, so your earnings might, you know, come close to doubling. At some point, uh, the shift begins to go more toward uh, juniors and explorers and things like that. I, I don't know what that dollar amount is for gold. It, uh, it's going to vary from company to company, but I just kind of want to get your process and how you know that whole thing kind of lays out as you shift your investment focus from the big companies to the smaller ones well you're gonna to have to take me off this question with a hook <laughs> uh, i love this question you know you know to begin with eric is as good a judge of the impact of a story on a market as anybody that i've ever seen understanding not just a primary bull market, but the phases of the market and how the phases of the market will attract various constituencies is just an absolutely astonishing talent of Eric's. It's also worthwhile to know that Eric's um, financial and psychological tolerance for risk is very, very high. Yeah, That's why he's a billionaire. Uh, but the truth is that while most people that listen to your podcast might pretend to be investors, uh, I suspect they're mostly speculators. And if you are a speculator, the idea that you would reserve some of your speculative portfolio for circumstances that if you were wrong could, ha could cost you half your money, but if you were right could make you 10 or 15 times your money. Uh, that's just exactly the style of risk reward that has made Eric Sprott Eric Sprott. The arithmetic that you talk about is very worth repeating. If you are what the industry would term an inefficient producer, let's say last year you made gold at $1,100 an ounce all in, you sold it for $1,200 an ounce, so you made $100 an ounce. Now the gold price goes from $1,200 to $1,400 an ounce, so the gold price is up 12 or 13%. But as a producer, your earnings have tripled. Think about that. Yeah. Uh, and it actually goes beyond that. Um, you will have, uh, I'm talking about you as a company, you will have mineralized material that isn't economic to, this, to extract at a certain gold price. But as the gold price goes up, more of the material that you have, which is marginal at lower gold prices, becomes economic. And the capital cost associated with extracting it is very low 
because you've already spent the capital to extract the higher quality uh, rock. So not only do you get an earnings escalation, but even as you're producing, you get a resource and reserve uh, escalation. It's really a double or trippy, triple whammy yep. in a positive sense. Now, don't do this with 100% of your capital. If you happen to be wrong about the gold price move, I don't believe we are, but if you happen to be wrong, don't use money that you need for a child's college education or your breakfast to do this kind of thing with. But for surplus capital, where you're looking for truly outside gains, where you have the financial and psychological staying power to, to uh, take the risk, uh, this is a very, very, very valid and, in fact, highly intelligent strategy. Yeah, no doubt about it. And then hopefully we're all going to get a chance to reap some of those rewards in the uh, months ahead. Because, as you said, uh, we think we know where, where the metals prices are going. To that end, the last thing I wanted to ask you about, Rick, uh, Rick, uh, Eric has been very vocal over about the past month on these podcasts uh, about where he thinks silver is headed. And consequently, I, it's like he's looking under every rock that he can find, <laughs> no pun intended, um, to find silver plays. You know, there are very few straight up silver plays. You know, most silver mining is done as a part of base mining or gold mining. You know, you get silver on, as a byproduct almost. So he's having a hard time finding silver plays. Um I would imagine you probably in the same boat. What, what, how would you try to find silver uh, miners well, for, and investments? First of all, you couldn't be more right. Uh, historically, in precious metals bull markets, gold moves first, silver lags, and then silver moves further. Uh, silver, however, is ubiquitous. There's lots of it around. Maybe not enough to cover uh, what's been contracted for in paper markets, but there's a lot of silver. Silver stocks, however, are rare, and high-quality silver stocks are rarer yet. Um, one of the uh, formulative experiences of my career was in the early 1970s, first of all, watching the silver price go from, over the course of that decade, from, say, what, a buck sixty, a buck seventy, up to a, a peak of $50, which was pretty spectacular. But compare that with the shares of Coeur d'Alene Mines, which went from a dime to $65. Hmm. Uh, the truth is that the leverage inherent in silver stocks, the operating leverage is fantastic, but the fact that they're so scarce and the fact that the upside volatility drives capital into them in such extraordinary senses is really hard to imagine. My friend Doug Casey uh, described capital flowing into silver stocks uh, during a silver bull market as being the equivalent of trying to siphon Hoover Dam through a garden hose. Uh, a, a fairly apt uh, discussion. Yeah. So my suspicion, and Eric would, of course, uh, describe me as granny rule in terms of the conservatism <laughs> that I'm about to display. Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I would suggest that you begin, begin a silver portfolio while silver prices are low like they are now by owning silver. The first thing to go up will be silver. And, of course, if you're a U.S. taxpayer, I would suggest the Sprott Physical Silver Trust. Yes which is taxed at the capital gains level rather than at the ordinary income tax level. But if you have a predilection for physical, I'm sure my good friends at Sprott Money could help you with that. That's for sure. Beyond that, beyond that, I would move into the very highest quality silver companies. You want to participate in the market beta. In other words, the move up in the silver stocks will be dramatic enough that uh, for most people, having at least 75 or 80% of their silver portfolio in high-quality companies is recommended. Now, if you're Eric Sprott and you have owned the high-quality silver companies for three or four years, what you do is you move into the companies with the most leverage, uh, which is precisely what Eric's looking for. And when he describes himself as looking under every rock, that's a little disingenuous. Uh, Eric has probably provided somewhere between 15 and 20% uh, of the equity finance <laughs> in the Canadian mining sector uh, yeah, this year. Yeah. So everybody, ourselves included, are bringing those rocks to Eric. He isn't having Good to point. look too hard. He's <laughs> just having point. to be fairly selective. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sprott, to, to the benefit of Eric, to the benefit of me, and to the benefit of you, has become, in effect, a financial brand name for silver. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. And in searching for that high-quality silver producers you said what, what's the main thing you look for is there a certain metric 
Oh, uh, well, well the, the high quality ones, you look for people who generate cash at this level. They're few and far between. Yeah. The, the second thing you do is you go to uh, where Eric goes. That is to say, producers that have the ability to produce a lot of silver, but don't make any money at this level. Uh, I personally err towards companies that have larger deposits because in my experience, large deposits generate positive surprises and small deposits generate negative surprises. The other thing that you need to be able to do is you need to be able to consider jurisdictions that you might otherwise be uncomfortable with. The big silver producing countries in the world, Mexico and Peru, are uh, countries where the jurisdiction is sometimes uncomfortable for uh, Canadian or American investors. And to really be represented in silver, you need to go where the silver is. No doubt about it. Got to be ready for that and uh, do a lot of your own homework and your own due diligence and uh, make the assessments, whether it fits in your long-term plans before doing anything, obviously, as well. We've been speaking with Rick Rule, Sprott USA. Uh, Rick, this has been extraordinarily valuable. Thank you so much for your time. Well, once again, I'm uh, honored to fill in for my mentor and far- former partner, Eric Sprott. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you, Rick. And from all of us at Sprott Money News and SprottMoney.com, thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again next Friday. <laughs>